You can never get a cup of tea large enough or a book long enough to suit me. This is Pints with Jack, Season 7, Episode 2. Inaugural C.S. Lewis Reading Day, After Hours with Professor Diana pavlak Glyer. Thank you for downloading this episode of Pints with Jack, the podcast where we discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season we're going to be looking at Lewis's letters, but today is the inaugural C.S. Lewis Reading Day. And the opening quotation comes from C.S. Lewis, reported to us from Walter Hooper in Of This and Other Worlds. In today's episode, we're going to be doing what we're encouraging everyone to do on social media today, namely to share favorite Lewis quotations and to talk about how Lewis has affected our lives. David isn't here today, so the uh, inmates are running the asylum. David's busy collaborating with the Talking Beast podcast, but that just means that Matt and I get our guests all to ourselves, a fan favorite, a dear friend, Professor Diana pavlak Glyer. She's a professor at the APU Azusa Pacific University Honors College and the author of Bandersnatch, The Company They Keep, and most recently, The Major and the Missionary. So we, we need to start with, uh, well, first of all, welcome, Diana. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Glad to be here. I wanted to start, though, with the story that we couldn't capture in the recording and because we weren't recording yet. But right when we got on, we've, we've had a few hiccups getting going. And Diana made the funniest joke I think I have ever heard. She goes, well, I saw David wasn't going to be joining us. And so I factored in a little bit of time for some hiccups in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we would I sink like it. a stone without him. Uh, listeners, if you, yes. could, if you were watching the video, you'd see our little bust of C.S. Lewis right behind me. And we'll talk in a moment about what we're uh, what we're drinking, but it's such a joy to be here with you, Diana. I, it just as I looked over the show prep, it's like uh, I've been prepping for this for thirty years, right? It's you know <laughs> it's been uh, thirty years of reading and loving Lewis, and then we first met in two thousand and six. I first read Company They Keep that year, two thousand and six? No, two thousand and seven. So it's been sixteen years of prepping for this episode. So it just looked like having yeah. fun with my friends. So how are you doing? I love it. Doing really well. Doing really well. Excited about uh, our conversation today at this auspicious season where we're celebrating Lewis in a number of different ways. It's great. Well, and we cooked up the idea of C.S. Lewis Reading Day uh, months and months ago. We figured Tolkien has three days during the year. And so it was time for us to give Lewis one. So I couldn't think of anybody better to have on for our inaugural episode. Well, thank you for that. I'm so excited. Well, before we dive in, what is everyone drinking today? Well, it's still morning. It's uh, actually quite early by uh, my time, and so uh, it's coffee for me. <laughs> okay. Any particular kind of coffee? This is a uh, French roast brewed very strong with a dash of cinnamon um, oh. mixed in. Yeah. Ooh, that sounds yeah. so good. I had a San Antonio blend, which has a little bit of cinnamon in it. It was the blend I mentioned it last time. Uh, that uh, that Tolkien's daughter Priscilla enjoyed. Um, but in honor of Lewis Reading Day, I'm drinking a Boddington's. Um, I have a friend from Manchester and that's where it's brewed. This is also the first beer I had in England, my first trip to England in 2008. And I had a Boddington's. Um, uh, dear Kate uh, brought it to me in the garden of the kilns. And so I figured it was, uh, <laughs> it was appropriate. So what about you, Matt? Well, I was originally drinking Spindrift because it is still, well, it's not uh, morning because we are East Coast time. It's still early afternoon, but David or uh, Andrew convinced me because it's Lewis's reading day. So now I have poured some Irish whiskey Bushmills uh, yes. in honor of Lewis. Uh, excellent. I got some time last week, a couple of weeks ago with Ross Wilson from Belfast, and we were waxing poetic about, uh, about Bushmills. So who are we toasting, Matt? I love every one of our toasts, so I got to be careful, but I'm, I'm very excited for this one, Brittany White, because she, she's she been with our community from like the very beginning in the most so active, making graphics, so helpful, planning stuff, inviting people to her house, just a lovely individual. And so we get a toast, Brittany White. And so I'd like us to raise a glass. And on this C.S. Lewis reading day, Brittany, may Lewis continue to 
work in your heart, the words that he writes to change your mind, to change your heart and allow you to go further up and further in every single day. Cheers. 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 All right. No chime sound. There we go. Oh, <laughs> and Brittany's one of my favorites too. We met in person and that's that was just a joy. So, well, I can't wait for this conversation because it's the kind of thing that I was texting Diana before the show. It's the kind of thing I never stopped talking about anyway. So I think this is just an excuse. <laughs> yeah. A long list. <laughs> yeah. It amazed my high school students that people would actually pay me to talk about C.S. Lewis. They're like, yeah, Lazo, we'll pay you to shut up about him. I mean, you never, it never stops. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I want to know, I know a little bit of the story, but for our listeners, uh, Diana, I would love to hear again how you discovered Lewis in the first place. I think we kind of had opposite approaches. Yeah, I uh, read Tolkien first, and uh, because everyone in my high school was reading Tolkien, I read Tolkien in self-defense, and (laughs) while I found it difficult to get into the book because I kept mixing up the characters' names, once I sorted that all out, I just adored that book so much. I, I think what appeals to me about Tolkien still is his ability to immerse us in a really well thought out, well drawn alternative world. It is uh, it is so well done. And so I, at that time, started looking for something that was exactly like Tolkien. Back in the day, there, there wasn't much mm-hmm. uh, that was even remotely like the kind of thing that he does in The Lord of the Rings. So I did, in my search, stumble across uh, Lewis and found Out of the Silent Planet. Oh. And I loved it because it did so much that was similar in terms of an uh, alternate world. World building was so rich and fantastic, but it had this very strong then spiritual um, aspect to it. I, I think when I started reading Lewis at that time, what what struck me more than anything else was the combination that I found in his work between the power of intellect, of, mm-hmm. of really thoughtful insight, but to see that married so beautifully with the idea of imagination. So bringing together head and heart, and mm-hmm. I just still to this day don't know that there's another author in which head and heart are both uh, so fully alive. Yeah. You know, that's marvelous. Um, I I love that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my entrance was a little opposite. I couldn't get through Tolkien until I found out that C.S. Lewis had been a very hands-on editor for him. And that actually unlocked it for me. But, um, and when I did Mere Christians, it's it's always fascinating for me to find out where people's first book was. And Out of the Silent Planet Mm -hmm. is not one of the, one of the common ones. How about you, Matt? Tell, Tell us that story again. Yeah, mine was, uh, this was when I was at Oxford for that year back in 2010, 2011. And I was really wrestling with atheism. I was really pretty down and depressed. And I was struggling because I thought for at that stage of my life, when I got into the Oxford program, I'm like, oh, this is beautiful architecture, beautiful area, the academics I'm really looking forward to. And I was miserable. I mean, it was like the darkest Mm. period. And put me on this deep exploration path of reading philosophers, different worldviews, just trying to find the answer to life because accomplishments was not the answer. And uh, as I'm reading this stuff, a friend recommended Mere Christianity. And it just, I didn't quite finish it and think Christianity is true. I was was very intrigued, but I said, even if you just live this way, I feel like this will bring happiness and joy. And so that was the thing that opened me back up to exploring Christianity. So... That kicked it all off. I went back to my senior year in college, did a whole theology minor, and <laughs> there's Andrew list, lifting up mere Christianity. I love it. <laughs> you started reading Lewis in Oxford. Yes. Okay. That, you can hold me to this, is the ultimate flex. <laughs> you spent a year in Oxford <laughs> well, I was, and discovered Lewis there. What you have to realize too is my apartment, I didn't know any of this at the time. This is a very divine providence. I was at New College and I was in an off-campus apartment right across from that gate of Maudlin College, uh, the mm-hmm. side street gate. And so then I went into yeah, Maudlin yeah. College when I realized Addison's Walk and I read The Great Divorce, Screw Tape Letters, and Miss and, and Mary Christianity all within like two months uh, while mm-hmm. I was there. Wow. That's oh, profound. That's, that's extraordinary. What an experience. It was so, yeah. I mean, it's such, it was such a gift. God has been... 
there's no excuse for me ever to be an atheist in life because I look back at the role God played in these different things that are just way too coincidental. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, and that's yeah. a, such a town that's alive with imagination and thought. And yeah, mm-hmm. the listeners will know it's an oft repeated story, so I don't need to belabor it, belabor it. But I first came to Lewis through Narnia from the gift of a of an aunt. Um, and that was long before I ever came to faith. And then reread Narnia after coming to faith in my early teens. And then when losing my faith or questioning my faith and the depth of what I was seeing, um, Phil Keggy lent me letters to an American lady. And that's our current mm-hmm. season right now, Diana, as you know, we're, we've just recorded our first episode and we thought we could skip a few letters, but we're finding that we can't. Um, just the, <laughs> the, the, the lively wit and the good humor and the humility and then the deep driving faith um, around all of that. He just, he did that so lightly. He, he seemed to kind of hold all of that so easily in one, you know, um, I mean, Lewis wrote of Joy Davidman, hear the whole world in one single mind, right? But Lewis himself did that. Mm-hmm. So, so that was the entrance to me. And much like you, Matt, once I started reading Lewis, it was like chunking paperbacks into a big, a big trash bin. I just couldn't mm-hmm. get enough. I read everything I could put my hands on. I'm so mm-hmm. excited that you're taking time to study the letters because, you know, the answer uh, to the question I always get, which Lewis book would you take on a desert island is always collected letters. It's, yes. it's a cheat because it is three volumes. <laughs> and yet you see all of the wisdom of Lewis there, but you also see him at his most authentic. Yes. As he's adapting to the various correspondence, you see sides of him that you wouldn't see. So you know that I've written about the algebra of friendship, right? That yes. idea that different people bring out different facets of us. And what you see in the letters are these different correspondence that reveal to us these different facets of Lewis. And I just, I never get tired of of reading his letters. It's an Mm -hmm. extraordinary experience, really. I'd love to hear each of you guys is, you know, Lewis is incredible as we've all experienced at taking these these complex ideas, theological concepts and distilling them into just really bite-sized ideas that pack a huge punch. And so I'm just curious if you guys have a, a favorite Lewis quote it doesn't have to be direct or passage or concept. Yeah. Before we get there though, I, I love that Diana kind of leapfrogged the question. Um, I'll echo what she said. I mean, my work until we have faces notwithstanding and still, you know, I mean, you all know where I come out on that, but in terms of sheer reading <laughs> pleasure, um, Okay. Yeah, we have a drinking game, Diana. You have to drink every time I mention Lewis's far and away best book. So have a sip. Here we go. It's a good thing. It's just coffee. <laughs> yes, we got to ask a little... Diana too. Does she? Does she agree? Does she agree with that? Is that his best book? Is Till We Have Faces his best book? Yes, Lewis by called, far and called Till We Have Faces far and away my best book and much my best book. Uh... <laughs> See, that's what I I don't I don't disagree with it. I just don't. We're going to stop right there. The shelf. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, cut that clip. No, gonna, I 100 percent agree with everything no, no, no. Andrew says. No, 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 no. Right no, 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 no. But if you All don't right, disagree, sorry. that's good enough. Um, actually, just on Facebook, <laughs> the last couple of days, there was a discussion about um, becoming Mrs. Lewis, and uh, Michael mm-hmm. used a word definitive. Uh, and, uh, about one of the biographies. And I said, you know, I, uh, I'm, I would like to argue with Michael about what he means by definitive. I'd like him to define definitive and then I'll buy the next round at the pub. You know, I love those, those fierce arguments, but I would agree with Diana when people ask me what his favorite book is, what my favorite book is in terms of the sheer pleasure of reading. Yeah. All of the collected letters, because in volume one, you have the pre-Christian Lewis, um, and you hear details of his life and the, mm-hmm. the the dishes that he would do and and his incredible cramming for his his English degree in eight months, um, a three year degree. Mm-hmm. But the leisureliness, even though it wasn't leisurely for him, the leisureliness of ambling through the eighteen hundred pages of Collected Letters, Volume Three, and hearing his terse, humorous, humble, friendly presence and. I love when Warney is away um, because when Warney's away, we get these long letters that say so much about his most intimate thinking. 
And so the letters to Warney yes. and Arthur are intimate. The letters that we get in volume three to Sister Penelope and to St. Giovanni um, and to Mary Van yes. Dusen to a lesser extent, but he is mm -hmm. so open with his emotions. It's almost confessional, his letters to priests yes. and, and, and religious. And that's, you don't see that point, that, that piece of Lewis anywhere else. So you really get a holistic view of him. And I just love mm -hmm. kind of sitting down and plunking a book open anywhere in the letters and finding an hour and a half just happily evaporating um, and, and just merrily going down the trail. Yeah, when I was working with my students on looking at the letters, we would read the letter that corresponded to the date, the, mm -hmm. the month and day uh, when we were meeting. And that was an interesting exercise to just kind of time travel a little bit and see mm -hmm. that. I, I think as most of your listeners know, there's just been a newly released updated edition of Tolkien's letters that has letters we haven't seen before. And Walter, of course, was working on a fourth mm -hmm. volume Mm -hmm. of collecting the additional letters uh, from C.S. Lewis. So perhaps someday we'll be treated to volume four of ah. Lewis's collected letters. Wouldn't that be a treat? From your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> no, well, time is flying. And so, Matt, I did interrupt me interrupt you. And I've got nieces and nephews where the day before Thanksgiving is when we're recording this. I actually just celebrated the mass of C.S. Lewis, the lesser feast of C.S. Lewis at the uh, Episcopal Church of the Redeemer in Sarasota, Florida, my first time as a priest celebrating Lewis's feast mm. uh, in, with Holy Eucharist. And so we're squeezing this in. Diana moved the time and Matt did as well so that I could do this before we go see the, the nieces and nephews. And so, uh, Matt, I think you were asking about a favorite book or a favorite essay or a specific work uh, that stands out as meaningful. And Diana, what if besides the letters, would you pick any, what would you pick from all of those? Yeah, I, if I can have a little bit of time, my, my favorite quotation yeah, from Lewis is one that you don't see very often, and maybe it's because it's too long to fit on a meme, um, and it's a, <laughs> from, from Narnia, from The Horse and His Boy. Mm. Uh, I think you know, you're asking about what is his best book, and, and I think that that is such a complex question, mm -hmm. but I do think that Horse and His Boy has the most perfectly structured plot of anything that Lewis uh -huh. wrote. Uh -huh. As listeners will know, the main character is a boy named Shasta. And in my favorite passage, he finds himself in a, in a really tough place. M may I read this? Would you Absolutely. please? So Shasta has had a, a really tough time and he's thinking back over the experiences of his life. And, uh, and this is what he says. I do think, said Shasta, that I must be the most unfortunate boy that ever lived in the whole world. Everything goes right for everyone except me. Mm. Those Narnian lords and ladies got safe away. I was left behind. King Loon and his people got safely to the castle, but I get left out. And being very tired and having nothing inside him, he felt so sorry for himself that the tears rolled down his cheeks. What put a stop to all this was a sudden fright. Shasta discovered that someone or, or somebody was walking beside him. It was pitch dark and he could see nothing. And the thing or person was going so quietly that he could hardly hear any footfalls. What he could hear was breathing. His invisible companion seemed to breathe on a very large scale. And Shasta got the impression that it was a very large creature. He had come to notice this breathing so gradually that he had really no idea how long it had been there. It was a horrible shock. The thing went on beside him so very quietly that Shasta began to hope he had only imagined it. But just as he was becoming quite sure of it, there suddenly came a deep, rich sigh out of the darkness beside him. That couldn't be imagination. Anyway, he had felt the hot breath of that sigh on his chilly left hand. At last he could bear it no longer. Who are you? He said, scarcely above a whisper. One who has waited long for you to speak, 
said the thing. Its voice was not loud, but very large and deep. Are, are, are you, are you a giant? asked Shasta. You might call me a giant, said the large voice, but I am not like the creatures you call giants. I can't see you at all, said Shasta, after staring very hard. Then, for an even more terrible idea had come into his head, he said almost in a scream, you're not, not something dead, are you? Oh, please, please do go away. What harm have I ever done to you? Oh, I am the unluckiest person in the whole world. Once more, he felt the warm breath of the thing on his hand and face. There, it said, that is not the breath of a ghost. Tell me your sorrows. Shasta was a little reassured by the breath, so he told how he had never known his real father or mother and had been brought up sternly by the fishermen. And then he told the story of his escape and how they were chased by lions and forced to swim for their lives. And he told about the heat and the thirst of their desert journey and how they were almost at their goal when another lion chased them. I do not call you unfortunate, said the large voice. Hmm. Don't you think it was bad luck to meet so many lions? There was only one lion. What on earth do you mean? I've just told you there were at least two the first night, and there was only one, but he was swift of foot. How do you know? I was the lion. And as Shasta gaped with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued. I was the lion who forced you to join with Erevis. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses new strength of fear for the last mile so that you should reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion who do not remember, who pushed the boat in which you lay a child near death so that it might come to shore where a man sat wakeful at midnight to receive you. Mm. One almost needs to not to do anything with that, but tell us more what that stands <laughs> out. Yes, I was thinking the same thing. It's, it's hard to unpack all of the great theological truth mm -hmm. that that scene encapsulates. Mm -hmm. such a short passage. But I think I've been thinking about this passage a lot and reflecting on it a lot lately because I'm thinking back, uh, Andrew, you'll remember to a, a situation in my life years ago where I was facing some real challenges and I didn't think I was going to make it. Mm -hmm. And I considered myself the most unlucky and unfortunate individual to ever walk this planet. And it was really, really hard. And you came alongside and you said, there will come a day when you'll look back on this and not only will you have survived it, but you will see the hand of God in it to such an extent that you will be grateful for mm. it. And I mm. thought that was the craziest thing I had ever heard. Mm. Seriously. <laughs> I thought my friend Andrew has definitely gone off the deep end at this point. Mm -hmm. And this last season of my life, I've been looking back at a number of situations that have been terribly difficult and found that my overwhelming sense of it is God was in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm profoundly grateful mm -hmm. for the way that he worked in each and every one of those situations. Mm -hmm. I think what's so beautiful too is you're reading it. It packs a punch when you you hear someone reading it and different parts jump out. But I love how, you know, he's complaining in the beginning and he finally starts to sense that this lion is real in there. And and Aslan says, tell me your sorrows. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love that wording. He doesn't say, stop complaining. <laughs> you know, or come on, man. I've been, I've been doing this this whole time helping you. It's like his first thing is like complete empathizing in that moment. Tell me your sorrows. 
Because mm-hmm. my first thought was, as you're reading this, is, is thinking of the great divorce where it's like, let's not be a grumbler or a grumbler or however it goes. And it's like, mm-hmm. let's not be a complainer here. And that's kind of what you're seeing happening with Shasta. But that's not at all what Aslan says. Tell me your mm-hmm. sorrows. Like, let this play out. And then obviously transitions and shares how he's been there with him throughout all of it. But there's just such a truth of in there and like wisdom for our own life, not only the role Christ plays in our life, but what we can do for others. First start by like, tell me your sorrows. Yeah. Then of course we can talk about the role God's playing in there, but just tell me your sorrows. Yeah, Matt, I know that you were about to quote this, so you'll forgive me for just jumping in and scooping you. (laughs) As the marvelous poet Mary Oliver says in her poem, Wild Geese, (laughs) Diana, we're slowly convincing Matt to at least appreciate some poetry. Uh, But Mary says, tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Mm. And yeah, Mm. my wife is fond of teaching that passage and I love it when she does. The reading of the long passage too, Diana, I thank you for that. I get a little tired sometime Mm -hmm. of the memification of Lewis um, because Mm -hmm. sometimes it takes a whole paragraph to set up a thought or a whole chapter or a page or a chapter or even a book. Um, and Lewis is so much deeper than than the memification of him has has done, notwithstanding David's remarkable quotes that um, that folks will be sharing all over the world today uh, because he did some quote graphics. Um, but to read Lewis, you need to really read him. And I was struck not only by your reading, Diana, but it reminded me at the Mere Anglicanism Conference in South Carolina, um, Simon Horobin, who is professor of medieval literature at Maudlin. He, he, his rooms are a couple staircases down from Jack's. Just read a paragraph from, I think, Don Treader or something. And it was so full of wit and good humor and good sense that we all as a crowd just kind of gasped as, as he finished reading it. And it really reminded me to read more Lewis aloud and Narnia in particular. In terms of favorite quotes, I would be lying if I weren't mindful of the sermon I gave this morning. Um, uh, had a reading from Peter about, you know, considering it joy when we go through various trials. Um, and then a reading from from our Lord who says, I need to go away uh, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. But um, I latched on to, as I was praying over my sermon, a couple of phrases from his letters from Collected Volume 3. He says uh, to Sister Penelope, it would be very dangerous to have no occasions of worry. I have been feeling that very much lately, that cheerful insecurity is what our Lord asks of us. And just that phrase, to welcome worry, as a chance to express cheerful insecurity. And what a wonderful description of the the Christian life. We are never so secure that we are not um, on the edge of a knife, but we are always cheerful. Um, And I think Puddle Glum embodies that some. And the other phrase around which I built my sermon uh, was another letter uh, from volume three. He says, uh, by the way, my medieval mission at Cambridge is so far an estimable flop. A few <laughs> dons come to my lectures. And a friend of Lewis's, a student of Lewis's, told me that you could always tell where Lewis was lecturing because the bicycles were piled three deep in Oxford. He was one of the most popular lect- lecturers at Oxford. But he gets to Cambridge and he says, a few dons come to my lectures, but far fewer undergrads. I've never had such small audiences before. Must be frightfully good for me. And that (laughs) phrase and that attitude about trials, that our Lord would save us from every trial that he could, and he allows us through that trial because it is rather frightfully good for us. And that there's something that he wants to correct in our character, some bit of sanctification he longs to work out in us that he could do in no other way than allowing us to be in the trouble that we are, knowing that we are safe in his hands and that he will deliver us out from them. And for me, Diana, during that Mm -hmm. season, I was just peeking over the edge, as Lewis has done for me, as so many other friends have done 
you know, done for us. I just was a little further along a great grief of my own, a great trouble of my own, and could see just a little bit over the edge and frightfully good for us, or as Matt loves, a severe mercy. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah. It is frightfully good for us as individuals in terms of developing our character and deepening our faith, but it's also very, very good for us as a community, right, to mm-hmm. come alongside. And one of the things I love about this passage from Horse and His Boy is the physicality of it, the mm-hmm. detail of the breath of Aslan mm-hmm. on Chasta's hand. Uh, and we, we, when we come alongside, sometimes we do that in a psychological sense or a companionable sense. But, oh, what a difference it makes when, we've, when we literally come alongside and simply spend time side by side walking one another through these sorrows. And sometimes a hand on the shoulder, you know, a nudge on the arm, a physical contact. I think that that's part of what Joy did for Lewis was brought, brought him in touch with his physical self in a way um, that that nobody had. I think that she helped him kind of incarnate or embody himself. And I don't think he could have written in letters to Malcolm in 58 that the body needs to pray too, unless he had been kind of so embodied by Joy Davidman, who in her poem talks about running her finger along the cuff of his jacket or longing to touch the curls of his his hair uh, at his neck. You know, and and there's an embodiment to the love that they had for each other too. That um that that makes it such. I think one author writes a book uh, called "The Earthy Spirituality of C.S. Lewis," and uh, and that's yeah, certainly it's there. That incarnation. We're back to the way that we incarnate those abstract um, mm. qualities of God yes. as we interact with one another. Matt, yes. you haven't shared your favorite quotation. What is it? Well, it was perfect timing. You said incarnate the qualities because my favorite quote does come from mere Christianity when he's like, the son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. That the second time when we read it, I never really realized the concept of the divine life the first time I had read it back in Oxford. But when we went through it slowly, that whole section was really profound because it made me realize like when we, the whole concept of the good infection, when we bring ourselves close to Christ through prayer, through the sacramental life, um, through relationships, and, and he comes into us, there's something happening. It's not just like we stay who we are. There's like this transformation. I've always loved the word, I think more from the Orthodox tradition, but theosis, like there's, mm-hmm. there's this transformation happening on the inside. And so that, that one, I've always loved that's always stuck with me and it's just made me really excited for the Christian life. I I just find it gives you so much hope. Um, Mm. Even our darkest parts will be transformed. Mm. Yeah. I've always loved that one. And probably in relation to that, I actually do have it here because I had put this in a talk. The whole dance or drama or pattern of the Trinity is to be played out in each one of us. There is no other way to the happiness for which we were made. I think that connects with my story of how Christianity, when I was reading their Christianity in a season of uh, not happiness, <laughs> the opposite of mm-hmm. happiness. It's just when you enter into that Trinitarian dance, uh, and I love how he uses the word dance, mm-hmm. uh, and that pattern plays out in us, what happens to us. And so, yeah, those are some of my favorite ones. Hmm. And I'm, I'm glad you brought um, that back to mere Christianity, because when I think about the impact that Lewis has had on my life and the life of so many people, I predictably come back to mere Christianity. Mm -hmm. Uh, The idea that there is a non-negotiable core of the Christian faith. And um, what I think that Lewis does in so many ways in that book is unpack that saying that in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. And Mm -hmm. mere Christianity has been so impactful for me because of the way that it models unity, liberty, and charity all together, mm. all at the same time, all stitched together in such a thoughtful way. Mm. Mm. I love that. And that's partly because it's at her center where her truest children dwell, that something or yeah. a someone speaks with the same voice. Um, we had a conference earlier in the year called Still Speaking, C.S. Lewis's theologian for the third millennium. 
and at the flagship seminary of the Episcopal Church, several minds gathered and talked about how not only Lewis is still speaking, but I think that I think that we'd all agree, and and I think Lewis would gladly agree, that we take up Lewis because he helps us to hear the voice of God so well. Um, we would drop him in a heartbeat if we found something better, qualitatively, quantitatively better. But Lewis helps us, I think, to hear the voice of God still speaking through our culture. And I love that Lewis's best work are his kind of cultural artifacts, his fairy tales, his novels towards the end of his life. If he stopped after the 40s, I think we'd be far poorer <laughs> than we are now. Um, and uh, And yeah, I mean... That impact to my life is just immeasurable. I mean, I uh, I can't assess uh, the the impact of Lewis on my life. I met my wife from Lewis. I found my church. I found, a, in many ways, my vocation, and then I found the focus mm -hmm. of my life and of my ministry, which is to help make clear the love of God, which I believe is Lewis's real mission. And so, yeah, I mean, I owe him as much as one can one person can owe another. Well, and on that note, Diana, how have you seen Lewis impacting the lives of your students and and yourself? Yeah, I think I see in my students some of the same things that drew me to Lewis in the first place, is that mm -hmm. it's okay to be thoughtful, to be an intellectual, to read widely, uh, and still be a person of great faith. Uh, at the time that I became a Christian, that was a, not a given that we could be loving the life of the mind and also loving our Lord Jesus. Those things mm -hmm. were seen as almost opposites. You can, I've actually heard many a pastor say, you can either be a person of, you know, of faith or you can go do your homework. And <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't see those two impulses in opposition in any way, shape or form, but. Faithfully do your homework for God's sake. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so this affirmation of um, the intellectual life, but also the expression of that in uh, through the imagination. And I think that my students just continue to be willing to enter back into a Narnia state of mind mm -hmm. where they are enthralled by story and character and that they mm -hmm. learn so much as they are just drinking in the beauties of story. Mm -hmm. A child's heart and a grown up's head, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. Yeah. You know, Andrew, when you were saying earlier, the impact he's had on your life pretty much every day, but just every aspect of your life, I was thinking it is amazing how going back to what you said earlier, Diana, uh, with the horse and the boy and reading that beautiful passage and the lion next to you, ultimately it's God through Lewis, but doing this podcast in the end, I mean, Lewis was a starter of my journey towards Christianity or God through Lewis, but you know, we've now been doing this for seven years and every year, every season, a different book is honestly perfectly timed. My mm -hmm. darkest period, my second darkest period in the pandemic was the screw tape letters and reading all about habits and the importance of habits when you're not feeling mm -hmm. a certain way was mm -hmm. probably what it was exactly what I needed to hear for like 32 weeks straight as we went through <laughs> each of the different letters. <laughs> and uh, it's just amazing though. Like he's, he's the lion next to me. Now I know it's Jesus through him, but like that's just, that's his books are sure. always doing something at some season sure. of my life. Sure. And if it wasn't for this podcast, I wouldn't probably be reading it as frequently uh, because mm. it's just, there's there's almost a requirement, but it's a beautiful requirement. He's just remarkable. You know, Matt, I, I have a theory about yeah. why those books continue to be used so profoundly by the Holy Spirit and mm. why they apply to us, just as you say, in just the right time, just the right passage or just the right book comes to us. And, and it goes back to something that Walter Hooper said when he described C.S. Lewis as the most thoroughly converted man he ever met. So Lewis being so thoroughly submitted to the work of the Holy Spirit in every aspect of his being, his mind, his will, his emotion, his daily schedule, all of it, all of it submitted to Christ meant that the Holy Spirit was freed up to mm -hmm. work through his mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And we, we are the beneficiaries of that. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit hovers over us as we read Lewis because it hovered he hovered over Lewis when he wrote these things and that's 
That's the effect of prayer. As we pray over our work and submit it to God, God can say, all right, I can do something with that. Yeah. And it goes out and continues to be shepherded by the good shepherd as various individuals in various times and places encounter that work. It's it's moved and touched and inspired by God himself. Mm -hmm. I want to jump into that because I was just talking with Kristen in the car on the way back from celebrating mass about how, oh, a few months before his death, Lewis says to Warney, I believe, um, I've done everything that I was sent here to accomplish. And he's n not even wow. 65. He's a week shy of his 65th birthday. Mm -hmm. And especially as I get older, that seems quite young. But he was so submitted. And, and for <laughs> listeners, my pastor's heart comes out that it wasn't just Lewis kind of submitted himself once and then that was, you know, and then he was done. He says in your Christianity that, you know, the first thing is to push everything back and letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in and so on all day and so on all week and so on all year and so on for a lifetime. That, that thumbtack won't stay in the bulletin board of sanctification. And so we keep have to putting our taking our will and pinning it to that bulletin board of the moment and the hour and the day. It's not like Lewis was this great saint who made this decision and always lived that way. He struggled and struggled and struggled. You know, he struggled for years to forgive his first headmaster and only in his 50s did it. And so absolutely his life was surrendered to the Holy Spirit. But that surrender, I think, was a daily struggle and a daily battle. And to me, that's a great encouragement. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I did want to say in terms of impact, and just a small word, and we'll leave it here. Um, I, having just gotten back from the C.S. Lewis and Kindred Spirits Conference in Romania, to see Lewis open academic doors because mm -hmm. he's a respected intellectual and who has barely been translated into Romanian. I met the woman who translated Lion into Romanian for the first time in 1993, mm -hmm. and she was there at our conference. And so Lewis is this name to conjure with in the world of intellect and imagination in the university. And then we got into high schools, and I spent some time with Ross Wilson, the Belfast artist, and others. And Lewis became a conjure word to open doors. And we were in coffee shops and bars talking about enchantment and imagination and goodness and truth and beauty. And we were talking about Lewis and Tolkien and inspiration in public high schools. And there's a law against proselytizing in Romania, but we were able to kind of talk about the things of God because Lewis is still being discovered by Romania. He had never been really discovered before. And mm. so that impact continues to go on. Denise Vasiliu has done incredible work. And one woman in one country has been the kind of open door. And Lewis is still dancing through those doors and pointing us to, to our Lord. Yes, I know we're running long and I have nieces and nephews to get to, but Matt, go ahead and wrap us up. Yeah, well, I was just going to ask Diana before we go if there's anything else she'd like to say, anything you'd like to plug, any projects you're working on or recently released. <laughs> that's a hard, <laughs> hard How many? shift. <laughs> yeah, that's that is kind of a hard shift. Can I can yeah. I say I am excited? Uh, my newest book is a collection of letters that I've edited. Mm. And they're letters between Warren Hamilton Lewis and a missionary doctor named Blanche Biggs. And, and Blanche was serving in Papua New Guinea. She had read the letters of C.S. Lewis and wrote Warney a fan letter, enthusiastically encouraging people to read the letters of C.S. Lewis and then asking some questions, particularly about her own legacy. And this sparked what turned out to be the longest correspondence in Warren Lewis's life. Wow. Uh, and they wrote back and forth for a number of years, sharing not only friendship, but also some of their deepest fears, concerns, and frustrations. It was an extraordinary correspondence. I was delighted and privileged to be able to publish it and add a few annotations and a little introduction to it. So uh, Major and the Missionary is out now in paperback and will be coming out very, very soon as an audiobook, which I think will be very, very exciting, telling their mm -hmm. story in a dramatic fashion. Oh, I've got great. like five audible credits, so I'm ready for this audiobook. <laughs> 
Good. Yes, it's on my nightstand and it's another kind of breezy correspondence book. And so it's um, it doesn't take a lot of commitment to jump in and to follow it. Um, I'm not saying that the book is mm-hmm. light, but it's uh, uh, because we have both sides of the correspondence. I remember as I started reading it, kind of what I loved about reading Lewis's correspondence and each letter is kind of episodic in itself. So uh, strong recommend on that. Um, so, thank well, you. as we conclude, I just want to thank the listeners at, on our first inaugural C.S. Lewis Reading Day. Thank you for reading, Lewis. If you didn't read and love Lewis, mm-hmm. we'd be out of a podcast for sure. And it certainly has opened so many doors, as Lewis personally has opened in my life. And and we're excited to see what the impact of reading Lewis does uh, around the world. And so we're uh, we're grateful. And we couldn't think of anybody who we love better uh, on this show to have to kick off the inaugural reading day as one of the best readers of Lewis that I know. And that is not flattery. Mm-hmm. That's a bald statement of fact. So, Diana, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. It's been a real joy. Well, I hear the call for final drinks. So thanks to our sound engineers, Taylor and Sarah. And of course, thanks again to all of our listeners, especially our Patreon supporters, and particularly our top tier supporters. And those include James and Alex, Matt 1 and Matt 2, Erica and Joelle, Amanda, Thomas, Bud and Shane, Kay and Paul and Gary and Stephen and Kelly and Chris and John and James and Kate and Peter and David and Angela and Rowdy. We are so grateful for you all. And thank you for Mm. your support, which allows us to do the thing that we love most. Yes. And we pray for our listeners and all the prayer requests in our Slack channel every Tuesday. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share your favorite C.S. Lewis quotation on social media, tagging Pines with Jack and tagging it with hashtag C.S. Lewis Reading Day. Hear, hear. And please join us next time when we'll continue going further up and further in. Cheers. 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 Cheers.